Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Funke Apolabi Brown. Welcome to the Restful Sleep MD show, which is where we help families, including parents and their children, change their relationship with sleep so that you can all thrive and reach your fullest potential. So welcome to part three of our Sleep Apnea in Kids series. So over the last few weeks, what we've been doing is we've been delving into sleep apnea in children. And so we started off with what is sleep apnea? What are the symptoms of sleep apnea? How do we test for sleep apnea? What should we do, right? So if you haven't already, you need to watch that because it's going to really make this make so much more sense. And if you've not subscribed to this channel, I want you to do that right now by hitting the subscribe button below so that you, one, will know exactly when new content is released. And two, you help me get the word out up because it seems like the more subscribers we get, the algorithm sort of favors that. So more people can really get access to sleep knowledge that's evidence-based, that's not just people making stuff up, right? So back to our topic, how do we treat this? I titled this, this episode, Sleep apnea in kids, what every parent needs to know about treatment. I think this is important because as a parent, I want you to feel empowered. You may feel like, oh yes, the doctor said we have to do this one thing and that's the only thing they said is available. I want you to be empowered enough to say, okay, what are other options, right? I want you to continue to ask that question because there's a lot of options that are available for treating sleep apnea in children that many people don't even talk about. And so if you're a parent and you're like, well, they said we should do surgery. I mean, that's the first line treatment. And I'm going to tell you that off the bat. But depending on the severity of sleep apnea, uh, there are some other sort of what we call adjunct treatments. Like if you have milder versions of sleep apnea, if your child is not too impaired, that you might be able to consider using. But I think it's important that I, at least you know what's out there, you know the resources available, and then you can make the best decision for your child. Remember, you're your child's best, best, and only advocate, right? So you need to speak on their behalf. So now, you, your child has snoring, right? They had daytime behavior, tiredness, they had restless sleep. You got a sleep study, whether it was a in lab sleep study or a home sleep apnea test, you got a sleep study and it showed sleep apnea. So what do we do? There are many, many treatments. So I think we just have to come back and say, what is the goal, right? The child has all the symptoms. Sleep apnea is a dangerous condition that can affect their behavior, their development, their quality of life and overall health. So we do need to treat it. We're not gonna ignore it and just wish it away, right? So in terms of the options that are available, I sort of put them into three categories. The first, I would say, are the surgical options, right? The reason why I'm putting that up first is because tonsils and adenoid surgery is one of the more common surgeries that's done in children. So that's most likely what you will hear people talk about most. So we'll talk about surgical options. We'll talk about sort of medical, lifestyle, behavior options, because those actually exist. And then we'll finish up with more of like oral appliances and dental options, okay? So I hope you're sticking with me here. <laughs> okay, so what are the surgical options? The main surgical options are taking out the tonsils and adenoids. It's a procedure called adenotonsillectomy. Adeno, the adenoids, the tissue behind the nose, tonsillectomy, the tonsils, right? Take them out, scoop them out, um, laser them out, shave them out. I'm saying all that, but I'm not a surgeon, okay? So this is a procedure that's relatively common. It's usually done outpatient. Now, depending on several factors, if you have a child that has very severe sleep apnea, it should not be done outpatient. It's usually done with a plan to admit your child for observation overnight. Because if you have severe sleep apnea, your child could go either way once they treat. So you need to monitor. But then recovery time is usually about a week. Um, of course, some of the common symptoms children complain about is pain, but they'll give you pain medicine. Make sure you ask for pain medicine. Um, sometimes children might have loss of appetite. So you really want to start with soft diets and, you know, 
um, popsicles and liquids and things so that they feel better. And in some situations, some kids may actually have what we call tonsil bl bed bleed, where the child returns with a lot of bleeding. That's less, it occurs less often, but it's something you should be aware of. And then you, you know, you have the normal like fever and sore throat and a few other things. But overall, this treatment is very effective. There was a study that was done that looked at the effectiveness of adenotontelectomy in getting rid of obstructive sleep apnea in children and the success rate was close to 80 percent that is pretty good and when they looked at who were not necessarily responsive it was children that maybe had other risk factors so if you have a child who has um, hypotonia which is low tone or a, an underlying genetic syndrome like we call it down syndrome or trisomy 21 or you have a child that's very very overweight those situations the child sleep apnea may not completely resolve but might at least get better you may move them from severe to moderate or from moderate to mild right so it's still a very effective first line treatment and you also just have to you know really make sure that you're doing this it's done in the hands of someone you trust okay so that's one surgery now there's another type of surgery or there are other series of surgeries which really will focus on facial structure so if you have a child who has a very recessed jaw or if you have a child who you know for some reason or the other have you know some structural abnormalities sometimes they'll do surgeries to fix that structural abnormality to help their sleep apnea again very rare it's not something we take lightly there's a lot more complications with those the surgery the course for healing takes a lot much a lot longer now there's one newer treatment option called hypoglossal nerve stimulation and it's literally a pacemaker that just stimulates and contracts the neck muscles for your child. This is really in a very focused group of children, usually in children with a condition called trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. And the way it works is they attach it to surgery, right? So they put that pacemaker in and they put it on the nerve that controls that of those upper airway muscles. So as your child is sleeping and is about to have an obstructive event, it contracts. And so it kind of pushes their tongue out a little bit. So it gets the tongue out of the way so that their airway can be, you know, firm enough for them to breathe. Uh, it's been well tolerated, at least from the research we have, uh, really done in children who maybe you tried surgery, the conventional surgery, it didn't work. And then you tried things like CPAP and they were not able to tolerate it. So it's not something we jumped to right away. All right. So we talked about surgical options. Let's move now to more of medical alternatives and lifestyle alternatives. And there's a whole bunch under here. I want to start with CPAP. You may have heard of that, continuous positive airway pressure. So this is getting more common in children as well. Um, and it's definitely the mainstay of treatment in adults. And really what you're doing is with the use of a face mask and a tube attached to a compressor, it's not oxygen, it pumps air to the back of your child's throat. So remember what we talked about at the beginning that sleep apnea occurs when their throat is collapsing on itself. So that sleep compressor pumps air in. And like I tell my, <laughs> I tell my patients, if you have a flat tire, what are you going to pump it with? Air. And they're like, air? Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. They don't become dependent on it. They don't have any side effects to it. It just keeps that airway patent and open so that their brain can stop working over time so that they can get oxygen into their lungs they can get carbon dioxide out they can wake up refreshed it sounds delightful it is a lot of work because no child that i know of enjoys you just slapping a mask on their face and pumping air in it is it could be uncomfortable they could swallow air and so we usually will go through a period that we call desensitization and really what does that mean it just means getting your child used to it so we start off on very low pressures we wear it with them we do some behavior role modeling behavior uh, modification we do some reward system and get them to wear it gradually gradually i always tell people you can't put them on CPAP and expect that, oh yeah, the night, the next night they're wearing it through the night. This might take weeks. So you really need to be patient, work with your um, your sleep team to make sure that you're able to, you know, you're able to get the resources and the support you need. I can assure you it's very effective as well, but it does take a lot more intentionality. Now, the other thing with the other aspects of sort of medicaid management from a medical standpoint are things like medications 
So there's some medications that we can use to at least manage the symptoms of sleep apnea in a, in a, in a relatively well. Um, usually we'll use that in children that have very mild sleep apnea. Some of those medications include a chewable pill, we call it Montelukast. And what that does is it helps decrease inflammation that's contributing to the sleep apnea. And then another thing we tend to use is a nose spray called, you know, whatever, Momerazone. Um, there's so many of them over the, over the counter and then also prescribed. It's an inhaled steroid, nasal steroid. It's an inhaled nasal steroid, which you are then putting in their nose. Um, usually at bedtime, we'll squirt it into each nostril. One thing I really need to remind, tell you about is if you're using a nasal steroid, either for your child that has allergies or other nasal issues, you want to make sure you point that the the top or the tip of the nasal of the of the nasal steroid. You want to point it towards the air. So this is just an example. So you want to put it in this way and you point it towards the air, right? The reason why is because there's a bony membrane in the across the nose, and so if you point it towards the nose, you run a risk of actually causing a lot of irritation and they'll have a hard time tolerating it. So that was something I wanted to just throw out there. Okay, so that's the medications and it's relatively effective. Some studies show it doesn't really work. Some studies show it works in certain children. I definitely see it effective in children who might have allergies or certain allergies that's contributing to their sleep apnea. Now, another mode that we use that we recommend is weight loss right so if you have a subgroup if you have children that are overweight and we feel like their weight is what's contributing to their sleep apnea then weight loss healthy eating you know those lifestyle changes will always always help so that's another another treatment you know modality all right now let's move to the third category and those are the oral appliances and and things that are related to oral rehabilitation now, there's a lot of research that has been coming up now that shows that when we work very closely with our dental colleagues, we can actually get these children's sleep apnea resolved and much better. And so there are different devices that are used. Two main ones are called mandibular advancement devices, as well as just the oral appliances as itself. And there are quite a number of others. And so this is usually done with the help of an orthodontist. So you just need to know which type of dentist you're requesting. Not every dentist is, has expertise with this. And actually, it's a very small cohort of dentists that do this. But you can ask for your orthodontist. Now, I'm, taking, I'm going to take us back again to the symptoms of uh, or causes of sleep apnea, just so you understand. When we look at and we examine children with sleep apnea, we're looking at their tongue I talked about earlier, right? We're also looking at their palate. We have what we call the hard palate, which is the roof of the mouth. In some children, especially children that maybe they need braces, they may have an underbite, an overbite. In some of these children, you have a very high arched palate, meaning that it's almost like a triangle instead of it just being like a semicircle. And so because of that, when they fall asleep, their tongue may block their throat. So what our orthodontic colleagues can do is use a device that will either, we call it a palate expander. They have so many different ones right now. And what that will do is it will bring down that hard palate so that it doesn't have that shape anymore, so that the facial structure shifts and you're creating more room at the back of the throat. Very fascinating very effective it does take time and so you maybe need to be on other treatment options uh, prior to being able to get to see that effect right so that's definitely an option out there and then another thing that's really been emerging more and more is what we call myofunctional therapy and i love this because what it does remember we talked about the neck muscles um, the muscles of your throat being really relaxed right so what myofunctional therapy really focuses on is exercises around the throat to improve the musculature, to improve the strength of your throat muscles, right? So they will improve oral, they will improve facial tone, and as a result of that can improve sleep apnea. I personally don't recommend this as a solo therapy, but if you have a child who, you know, 
you're really struggling with all the other strategies or they have very very mild sleep apnea and you're noticing they have very low facial tone this may be something that you might want to consider again very few experts do this so you really need to make sure that you're doing it with someone you trust it's been a lot but that's it that is the those are the various treatments available there are a few other things but i really for the sake of this talk keeping it short i think the key point is the surgical options the medical options and their dental or, or facial rehabilitation options and you as a parent get to be that advocate to choose what you feel in partnership with the right information in partnership with a provider that you trust to make the right decision for your child we we need to treat it. It has a lot of side effects if we don't treat sleep apnea, but then there are quite a number of options and alternatives available. So I hope this has been helpful. Do me a favor and hit that subscribe button because I want to get to you as soon as I have new content. And also it helps me to get the word out there by some algorithms that are built into uh, YouTube. Okay. Now, if you are in Pennsylvania, if you're in New Jersey or California, this is these are the states I'm licensed for now, and you're looking for a sleep provider where, who will make you feel seen and make you feel heard. You're looking for a practice where we come towards your child and your sleep issues using a very holistic lens. Give us a call, schedule an appointment with us at therestfulsleepplace.com, and we're gonna help you change that relationship with sleep so that you could be well rested because your child is now resting well. 215-607-8297. I look forward to being a part of your restful sleep journey and your child's restful sleep journey. And until next time, I hope you rest well.